Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day two of AP European History. Hope you're all doing well this morning. Uh, right now we got 12 people in here. Hopefully we'll uh, get a few more as the minutes tick by. Today, what we're going to be talking about are a uh, number of um, strategies that you will be able to use as we progress through the class. These are strategies that you definitely want to uh, keep in the back of your heads um, uh, throughout the whole year, really, because um, I'm going to be talking to you about some very basic um, tricks that you can uh, that you can use and, and remember and have in your tool belt to be able to um, analyze documents, uh, perhaps with a little bit more uh, clarity or perspective uh, and begin to build context about the, uh, about the things that you encounter in this class. And that could be um, not just textual information, like say from your textbook or something like that. It could also be maps, it could be images or political advertisements or propaganda posters or what have you. So um, there's there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, that you can incorporate using some of these techniques. And um, I'm still waiting on being cleared for um, like administrative privileges on my computer so that I can install uh, uh, software that will allow me to screen share using YouTube Live. Uh, this is a capability that I'm able to do at my house, but I'm pretty devoted to the idea of coming here to work and doing my job at the physical location of the school uh, rather than doing it from my home. And so um, as of right now, I am still not able to screen share. Um, that doesn't prevent me, though, from being able to uh, provide you with the uh, necessary information and have you be able to follow along. So um, right now, since we only have 12 people in here, I'm going to hold off on the attendance side of things, which I will eventually have to do uh, if we get into the middle of the class and I still haven't done it yet. Uh, feel free to send me a, a, a you know, friendly reminder uh, in the chat and uh, we'll take care of it at that time. But for right now, if you guys could go ahead and open up Canvas and then go over to the files uh, tab. And in the files tab, what you should be able to see in there is um, a folder that says lecture PowerPoints. Um, they are actually uh, for right now going to be in PDF format because not everybody has uh, Microsoft PowerPoint on their computer, particularly a lot of times Mac users don't have PowerPoint um, available to them. So they are in PDF format. So you will still see them as though they are a slideshow type thing, uh, but you should be able to access them regardless of what machine you're on. And um, and so go ahead and open up the, uh, the PDF under the lecture PowerPoint folder within the files tab that says an intro to studying uh, history.pdf. And as you open that file, uh, you can download it and save it to your computer if you like. Um, I'm just going to be going over this uh, to give you, uh, we're, we're, my goal today is to try to begin to bring you back in time and um, help you to understand just how different uh, the world was back in the late Middle Ages. Now, um, sometimes the late Middle Ages are also referred to as the Dark Ages. And, um, and, and we'll talk about why that is as we, as we continue through this. Um, it, I just wanna take some time to go over this PowerPoint with you. So um, uh, the, the first one says an introduction to studying history. Scroll down to slide two. And if you'd like, you don't have to maximize the screen if you'd like to keep me up on the side. And I'm going to keep the chat bar up in case anyone has any questions or concerns. You can uh, type them in the chat. Uh, how do I get an A in AP Euro? Your success in this class is dependent on your ability to be able to 
uh, read and extract important information from passages, use evidence to support your historical arguments. That's a key factor, not only in history, but really in any facet of life. Um, opinions are held by everyone. And some opinions are, uh, are better than others because an opinion makes the jump or the leap over into an argument when you are able to support that opinion with rational evidence. And so um, not all opinions are, are created equal. And that's something that, that is difficult for us to understand in modern day times because there's such an emphasis placed on, um, well, because I think something um, I, that, that must be true or it must be valid or it must mean something because I believe it. Um, that is not true. And uh, put simply, the only way that uh, whatever personal opinions you have on any range of different topics uh, become valuable uh, to anyone else is when they are supported with rational evidence uh, that is based in reality. Um, and so, uh, you know, in this class, one of the major skills that, that um, I strive to um, impart uh, upon you is to be able to um, take uh, ideas and um, criticize them, not for the sake of criticism, but for the sake of uh, coming to a better understanding about the evidence that supports these ideas. Uh, remember numerous dates, events, places, names. Now, you will never be asked a question like, what year did this happen? Those sorts of questions are no longer important in society um, because uh, it's not that they're not important, but it's not important to memorize because uh, all of us for years now have had Google at our fingertips. And if you wanted to find out the year that George Washington was born or uh, the year that the Battle of Gettysburg happened or whatever it is, uh, all you got to do is type in to Google and, and you will find the answer uh, within seconds. The kinds of things that are uh, important in terms of remembering dates, events, places, and stuff like that are for the purposes of building context. So even if you don't know the exact year that things happen, if you have a rough idea of generationally, uh, as we move throughout the centuries, when major events took place, it allows you to build kind of a uh, quilt pattern in your brain of where stuff fits. Right. So if you have a general understanding, even if you can't remember that the French Revolution began in 1789, you might be able to remember that it began in the late 1700s, shortly after the American Revolution. And what this does is it allows you to place things into an order or a sequence of events. And this will help you make a lot better sense of the class, because um, that way, when you're asked something randomly, you can then be, be begin to be able to place whatever random thing that you've been asked into a greater context of other things. So if you're being asked about something pertaining to uh, a politician from the 1830s or something like that in Parliament in Britain, um, you would have some degree of idea by the end of this class, oh, well, this is a guy who's serving in Parliament right at the height of the start of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and there were a number of changes that were taking place in British society at that time where people were moving away from rural areas into urban areas and taking jobs in factories and uh, living conditions became very crowded and poor and so on and so forth. And this gives you a better understanding of uh, the sorts of, uh, of issues or, or the context that that person operated in within the scheme of history. And then to develop something called content literacy. And content literacy just simply means that you're basically as comfortable talking about European history as you are about talking about your own life. All right. Um, as you move throughout the class, you'll probably begin to see uh, um, you'll probably begin to see or, or, or um, you know, encounter things in your everyday life, whether it's YouTube videos or conversations with other people or, or whatever that remind you of stuff that goes on in history and to be able to talk about that and think about it. Um, Victor, yes. So it's uh, he said, uh, I'm on the road. I have very poor con connection. Is it possible that I do the classwork later? Absolutely. That's why we do it on YouTube. You're more than welcome to um, 
to do the classwork later and watch the lecture later. You don't have to do it right now. I do appreciate that you said something because that way I will not mark you absent. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, whenever you get a better connection, you can go ahead and, and watch this back. Okay, um, so we'll move on to the next slide. I'm now on slide three where it says the basics, dates, time, and years. So the thing about time is that really our modern conceptualization of time is relatively young. All right. Um, it really didn't come around until around the Industrial Revolution, where time needed to be formalized across uh, larger spaces, um, uh, geographical areas, so that uh, tr trains would arrive on time and people would show up to work on time and, um, and so on. Really, the likelihood that somebody owned a clock uh, much before the Industrial Revolution is pretty unlikely. Um, it really, uh, it, was a, it was a specialty item that only the wealthy people would have been able to afford or had any use for. Um, but prior to that, most of the time people mostly just kind of determined roughly what time it was uh, based on local um, sundials and other things like that of where the sun's position was in the sky uh, throughout the day. And um, so, and there really weren't organized time zones. There was no need to have time zones in a pre-industrial era because there was no chance that anyone would have been able to travel fast enough between geographical areas to necessitate knowing what time zone they were even in. Most people didn't even leave much more than a few miles away from the location that they were born. Uh, we do not deal with any BC years in, uh, in this class. We are a modern history class, meaning that uh, we only deal with AD, which does not mean after death, which a lot of people believe it does. Uh, AD actually is a Latin abbreviation, meaning Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. Uh, and this class focuses on the years from about 1450 to uh, around 2000, maybe a little bit after 2000. We've got some more recent events in history that have developed. Um, but typically the test is going to go right up to about 2005 or so, somewhere in that area, maybe a little bit after that. Uh, centuries always refer to the previous 100 years. If I ever say the 20th century, I'm referring to the 1900s. If I say the 18th century, okay, I'm referring to the 1700s and so on and so forth. Okay, so it always refers to the previous 100 years. Don't get confused about that. 14th century means 1300s, not 1400s. Okay, uh, moving on to the next slide, the basics, Roman numerals. You're going to encounter a lot of Roman numerals in this class. Uh, Roman numerals will succeed usually the titles of people like kings, uh, priests, uh, not priests, uh, popes, and, uh, and, and even sometimes other uh, scenarios where you'll see them. Good to brush up on Roman numerals. I is 1, V is 5, X is 10, L is 50, C is 100. Um, the reason it's important to know Roman numerals is because uh, Henry the Fourth, for example, is very different than Henry the Sixth. Uh, Louis the Fourteenth is very different than Louis the Sixteenth, and you wouldn't want to go through your entire DBQ talking about Louis the Sixteenth, but be calling him Louis the Fourteenth the entire time, as this could have an adverse effect on the score that you receive. Um, moving on to the next slide, where it says the basics geography. Um, if you click one more time, you'll see uh, that some numbers pop up where it says one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's made up of seven continents. This is very basic geography. I suspect that you learned this probably some there, somewhere in the area of about second grade or so. Uh, obviously one is North America, two South America, three is Africa, four is Europe, five is Asia, six is Australia, and seven is Antarctica. Uh, as we zoom into the next slide, we now see a continental uh, uh, map of, of uh, Europe. And you can see there uh, where the various countries within Europe lie. Now, this is a modern day map. So when you look at this, you're going to see uh, the modern geopolitical borders between all of the different European nations. Uh, as you move from uh, west to east, you will see uh, in the southwest corner of the map, Portugal, Spain. Uh, moving further to the northeast, uh, you will see France, Directly north from France across the English Channel is the United Kingdom or Great Britain, which is made up of Northern Ireland, uh, uh, Wales, Scotland, and England. Uh, you see Ireland, which is a sovereign nation. To the very far north, you'll see Iceland. And then as we make our way eastward uh, into Central Europe, you'll see places like Germany, the Czech Republic, 
uh, Austria, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, and so on. And as we make our way even farther east, we'll eventually move into territories like Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and even Russia. Now, um, this is a modern day map. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is because it, it's really good to know the map of Europe because, you know, when, when somebody talks to you about a country, if I'm lecturing to you about something that's going on in Germany or I'm lecturing to you in, about something that's happening in Italy, it's good to know where these places are geographically. It gives you a visual representation of where we're talking about, not just what we're talking about. And, um, and so I, I strongly suggest that you study this map and that you make sense of it, knowing that as we go back in time and we start back at the late Middle Ages, that the, that the map was not conceived of as it's displayed to you on this slide here in this political uh, representation. The, the map of Europe is, uh, contrary to maybe what you might think, uh, very fluid. The borders change over time, and they change a lot over time, all right? And, and really, to, make, to complicate the issue, uh, as you go farther back in time, the less, um, the less uh, recognizable the socio-political structure of Europe becomes. Um, what do you mean by that, Mr. Knight? Well, when we think about modern day uh, geopolitics, we think of the world in the framework of, of nation states, of countries, okay? Uh, so the country of Germany, the country of uh, Italy, and so on. One of the things that might surprise you a little bit is when we go back to the late Middle Ages in, in just a, a bit here, um, they really didn't conceptualize of the geopolitical framework in the, in the idea of nation states or countries. Uh, we were dealing with realms. We were dealing with kingdoms. Um, you know, these days we think of sovereignty as being a nation that is independent and has an independent government is able to run itself. Also, when we think of Europe today, particularly Western Europe, we think of them as being democratic uh, nations, nations that have democratic governments, that have voting and so on and so forth. Once again, this is something that's very, very new in history. Um, uh, democracies did not exist in Europe going all the way back to essentially the fall of the Roman Empire right around 400 or so AD. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the reason that this is important is because when we think of boundaries within Europe, when we think of the map of Europe, it is not constant. It is very fluid. The borders change. There are wars. Places are annexed, taken over. Um, incorporated into other empires, and so on and so forth. The main political structure that these places had were not democratic. Uh, sovereignty in those times lay in the hands of a monarch, a king, a single ruler, right? And, um, and, and you had a very rigid societal structure uh, that was where everybody had their place within society. It was a very um, rigidly... Uh, hierarchicalized uh, uh, framework where you had a king at the top of the realm, you had a whole litany of nobles, or uh, well, sometimes we call them aristocrats, that, um, that were regionally quite powerful. Um, also today, when we think of sovereignty, we think of a strong centralized government. Uh, another difference uh, going back in time in Europe is that a lot of the governments of Europe were very decentralized. The king, as much as he would have loved to believe that his power was autonomous, uh, that the king's power was absolute, and that he was the ruler of the land, in reality, in practice, particularly uh, the, the farther back that we go to a pre-Renaissance era, um, the, the king's power was, was anything but absolute. Um, regional uh, authorities of nobles like, um, and they have proper titles like dukes or earls or barons or uh, counts or whatever. Um, these these nobles held regional authority in their little corner of whatever realm that they lived in. And the king's influence in that realm was no doubt limited. And so uh, one of the changes that we see as we move into the Renaissance is that um, in some places, though not all places, uh, some places begin to centralize. 
uh, meaning that the king's power starts to become more and more and more centralized into a single state government. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. It certainly uh, takes a very long time for this to happen. And frankly, uh, it's, it's not the situation that the king's power is necessarily ever entirely absolute. Uh, at any given time, people were trying to challenge the king's authority. And um, this came from various different bodies of government. We will get into that when we talk about the era of absolutism. But as we move to the next slide, to the one that looks like a really old map, it says the basics geography. For instance, this is what Europe would have roughly looked like in 1099. Now, of course, this map is not from 1099. It's probably some from somewhere in the 1960s or, or what have you. And so this is not necessarily 100% um, accurate, but it's more accurate than the previous map in terms of giving you an idea of how the borders of Europe looked. And you can see that they look quite different from before. Um, the entire central region of Germany is uh, conglomerated into a single state, if you will, called the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the famous joke about the Holy Roman Empire is that it was neither Roman nor holy nor a complete empire. But um, that's a famous Voltaire quote from the uh, 1700s. But nonetheless, you can see that the borders look quite different. This is because it's not really thought of in the framework of nation states, but rather kingdoms or empires. Uh, places that you should probably know, it's good to know some names of cities um, as well as the actual countries. I'm not going to have you actually memorize this list, but, you know, it's good to associate if we know where London is. London's the capital of England. Um, if you know where Paris is, Paris is the capital of France. A number of the different Italian states are probably uh, uh, pro cities are, are probably good to know. And that's because Italy, believe it or not, doesn't unify into a single state until the mid 1800s. And um, so Italy remains for the vast majority of this class a, um, a segmented, uh, uh, separated conglomeration of smaller kingdoms and duchies um, based on more regional uh, ties. So uh, Naples or Venice or Rome, uh, the Papal States is where Rome is, um, and then Florence and other places like that. These were all independent of one another. They were not under a single Italian government. The same is true of Germany as well. Germany does not unify until the late 1800s, uh, even after Italy. And so in this class, when we refer to the region of Germany, typically in the first part of the class, we're really talking about the Holy Roman Empire. And then as time goes on, uh, we're talking about the German Confederacy, where still Germany was split into a multitude of different states. Uh, and, and it doesn't unify until around 1871 or so. Okay, moving forward here, you can see a modern day map again of Europe. Uh, really good to try to commit at least some of these regions to memory geographically in terms of uh, where their borders lie and where they, where they exist uh, on, the, on the face of the globe. Moving forward, the basics, feudalism. So the system of governance that, that um, was used back in this time, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was not a framework of nation states that... Um, that are divided into sovereign central state governments. Instead, we were under a system known as feudalism. Feudalism uh, made up the societal structure of medieval Europe, and it's very, very different from today. I mentioned earlier, there's a very extremely rigid social standing, and everybody in the world, um, you know, everything in the world, really, even, but from, from humans to animals to uh, plants to everything had a position within within a hierarchical structure of society. There were virtually no freedoms, no individuality. Um, people did not conceptualize of having natural rights in the uh, in the late Middle Ages. Okay, these were notions that were in the far distant future. Uh, individuality as well. Today, here in the United States, we live in a very individualist culture, where um, where people, uh, you know, value individual freedoms and and things like that. There was there was none of this back in the olden days. Uh, wealth wealth was virtually impossible to accumulate. Um, things like wage labor or going and getting a job 
uh, at a store or at a factory or something like that. They, it, it just really wasn't a thing. You had some professions like masonry or carpentry or, or uh, merchant traders, uh, things like that, that, that worked. I'm not saying that people never worked. They did work. But the vast majority of Europe at this time, 80% to 90% of people living across the continent of Europe, are peasants. They live in the middle of nameless hamlets, in the middle of nowhere. Um, they, they farm land that isn't theirs. They farm it from a subsistence standpoint. In other words, that are only farming just enough food to get by. Um, there really aren't commercial style farms at this time. In other words, the peasants don't grow an excess, a, a surplus of food and then send it on to uh, sell it on the global market or something like that. That stuff doesn't exist. Um, people live pretty much in isolation. You could be living in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Europe was a very, uh, you know, as the world, uh, as, as time has progressed, the world has become somewhat of a smaller place. Today, you could buy a ticket to Italy and go there and be there within 12 or 13 hours or so. Um, and and that's that's nice. It makes the world more accessible. But back in the in the olden days, uh, if you were born in the middle of a nameless shire in the in the middle of the forest somewhere, uh, the chances that you ever left home were were very very small. People lived and died their entire lives spent just a mile or so uh, in radius of the location from which they were born. Wealth is nearly impossible to accumulate because wealth at this time is tied up in land, and so um, you know if you are not a noble which only comprises a very small segment of society, somewhere in the area of about one to 3% at the very most, uh, you, you know, you're not ever going to own land. There's no chance that you'll ever go out and buy a plot of land and build a house or a cabin or something like that on it. You would never have been able to accumulate the wealth to do it anyway. And not to mention the land was all already spoken for, all right? It was, uh, the, the land was parsed out and, and titled to, uh, to, to the, the various nobles that lived across the countryside. Uh, most people were absolutely illiterate and ventured less than a mile or two from their birthplace, as I mentioned several times now. Uh, and again, that alone, I want you to consider for a second here. You know, kids in, in the United States uh, learn how to read from the time that they're probably about five years old or so. And certainly by the time that you're in second or third grade, you are at least, you know, partially literate. Right. You can read and spell and write your own name and other things like that. And um, and virtually no one in Europe was able to do this. Uh, and, and, and I want you to consider how important that is, because if you're not literate, if you can't read, if you can't write, um, there's there's really no um, educational system that would allow you to be able to think about the world um, in, with any level of, of depth or understanding. Science and medicine are just frankly non-existent. Whatever we called medicine going back to the 1300s would today look be looked at as barbaric. Um, and the other thing to remember about science and medicine is that they're very slow to develop. And I, I want you to just um, use the following example to give you a little bit of context. Imagine that you became ill with something, um, COVID or anything else, and, um, and you went to a hospital from the 1960s. Now the 1960s, uh, relatively speaking, is, is pretty recent, okay? It's within many people's uh, lifetime. I wasn't born yet, but certainly my parents were and probably your grandparents were and so on. And so, um, and so the 1960s really wasn't that long ago, but if given the choice to go to a hospital in the 1960s versus 2020, um, you're gonna pick 2020 every single day of the week because obviously there's been so much advancement in just the last 60 years or so think about going back to the 1300s okay now we're going back hundreds of years and the kinds of the kinds of uh, of treatments quote unquote that they would have been using on you uh would not have at all been uh based in any degree of uh scientific study or uh um, it, it could have actually quite literally killed you uh rather than made you better uh, which explains why the mortality rate was was in part so high uh, and that is because, number one, people don't have access to medicine. Number two, even those who did have access to whatever they refer to as medicine, um, uh, it did not really help them. It could have uh, much more likely harmed them. And then also, um, you know, if you become ill with something, which a lot of times kids become ill 
it, it, the likelihood that you made it through childhood uh, was, was pretty slim. If you did manage to make it until you were about 16 or 18 years old without having become ill with some sort of uh, you know, virus or bacteria, uh, say something even as simple as strep throat could have killed you um, as, a, as a youngster, uh, the, the likelihood that you made it into, uh, you know, your, your, your uh, you know, advanced years into, say, like your 50s or 60s was relatively good so long as you made it through childhood. But a lot of kids didn't make it through childhood. Um, uh, and that also partially explains why people had so many children is because there was anything but a guarantee that they would survive to adulthood. Today, uh, being that we take advantage of modern medicine and things like that, uh, people can, you know, have you know single family uh, or single single child homes, or only have one or two kids or something, and and live with relative confidence that their kids are, uh, you know, barring some sort of tragedy, going to going to live into their adult years uh, due to modern medicine. None of that existed back in those days. The other thing about the world at this time that you have to keep in mind is because we're in a pre-scientific revolution era, the world is filled with mysticism. Um, people do not have an acute understanding of what we would, in modern times, think of just as basic understandings of things. Okay, um, you know, the, the fact that you see the sun rise in the east and set in the west, you can see the sun move across the sky and yet still understand on a very basic level that the sun actually is not moving. The sun is stationary and, or at least relatively stationary within the scope of our solar system, and it's all of uh, the planets that are moving around it. This is again something that just wasn't conceptualized of by people at that time. They had no reason to believe that that was the scenario. They had every reason to believe, based on what they saw happen, uh, that the sun was moving around the earth and that the earth was actually stationary and in the center of not just the solar system, but the entire universe, which it certainly isn't. We're not even in the center of our own solar system, much less the galaxy, the Milky Way, um, uh, and even less the universe. So these are these are modern day understandings that we have based on um, based on on scientific study, uh, but they didn't exist in the 1300s, and they won't exist for quite some time. And they will be challenged by uh, all of the uh, traditional beliefs that people held about the universe, and also uh, intimately held based on their religion. And so, uh, which was largely Christian, which we'll get to in just a minute here. But things like witchcraft, um, magic, uh, hexes, curses, things like that, all of these, you know, um, all of these are, are everyday facts of life for people in the late Middle Ages. And it stands to reason that they would be, because absent of having some sort of explanation for uh, for all of these phenomena using scientific research and experimentation and uh, deductive and educt inductive reasoning and things of this nature, uh, you're going to live, if the world is, is, is highly unexplainable for you, the human mind is designed in a way to come up with explanations, rational, common sense ways of explaining things, regardless of whether or not they are based in reality. So science and medicine were extremely slow to develop. The world was highly mystical, very much misunderstood. And their explanation for much of the things that happened really came down to a very simple one. And that is because God willed it so. OK, so um, in other words, if you were to take, you know, let's say you took some wet, uh, you know, let's say you went on a run and then you took your sweaty clothes off and you threw them in a corner somewhere and a few days later, it's growing creepy crawlies on them and stuff like that. What's the explanation in the late Middle Ages? Well, these, these, they were willed into existence. God created them, okay? There is no scientific understanding about bacteria or, um, you know, moisture and growth of organisms and things. Nothing like that explains, uh, you know, anything back in those days because those understandings don't exist. Okay. Uh, the basics, feudalism, paternalism, and hierarchy. When we talk about paternalism, uh, that, that uh, prefix, P-A-T-E-R, pater, or pater, okay, is, uh, it means father, okay? Uh, and when we talk about patriarchy or 
uh, paternalism or things like that. We are talking about a very male dominated society. Now, um, this is not something that I'm saying in a disparaging factor of women or to undercut the influence that women had on men or anything like that. I think there's a famous quote out there that said that behind there, every great man, there's an even greater woman. But um, if we're talking uh, about the facts of, of history, the reality of, uh, of the day-to-day -day practices of society uh, rested very heavily on male-dominated society. So um, land is the most important asset. Land titles were passed down generationally through something called primogeniture. What this means is that the land title was passed down to the eldest son. Uh, and remember that this would have only been applicable to uh, noble families, people who actually had entitlements to land in the first place. Uh, there really wasn't much reason to pass anything down for a peasant family because they would not have owned any land in the first place. That being said, perhaps whatever knickknacks that they may have collected or found uh, would have been passed down uh, you know, um, but for, the, for their family as well. Uh, land, official title, estate passed down the generations. And so how does one become a noble? Well, this is an interesting fact. Uh, the, the way to become a noble is for the vast majority of them uh, just by way of birth. Uh, luck, really, is what it comes down to. You were born a noble. There was no way of, uh, in the early days, simply designating yourself a noble. Uh, and the likelihood that somebody would have gone from rags to riches started from the bottom. Now I'm here sort of uh, lifestyle did not exist. OK, it was not something where you were just suddenly newly wealthy and, and you won the lottery or something like that. Or you developed a social media app and it took off and you're now a billionaire. Things like that did not happen in those days. There was no opportunity for them to happen. Um, kings were powerful, but again, tended to share their power with the clergy, which is uh, when I say clergy, I'm simply referring to anyone within the um, hierarchy of the church. This could have included, which, which by the way, has its own hierarchy, which is very patriarchal. You've got the Pope, you've got cardinals, you've got archbishops, you've got bishops, you've got priests, you've got monks. They have their own rigid hierarchy. Once again, everything having its place from the very top down to the very bottom uh, uh, regiments of society. Uh, social political terms that you might want to know because you may run into these as we're doing some uh, lecturing and conversation over the next uh, several weeks. Primogeniture, I just talked about passing things down to the eldest son. Succession simply just means who succeeded the next, who came next in the line of succession. Kings die, they are succeeded by future kings, their children. Um, or, or other relatives if they, were, if they didn't have children, which does happen sometimes. Nobles, nobility, anyone at the top structures of society, very similar to uh, aristocrats. When I refer to the aristocracy, I'm referring to the governmental system of uh, nobles who carried political power with them back in those days. Anyone absent of a noble title would not have had any political power. Certainly, they wouldn't have been able to vote or anything like that. Feudalism, the structure of society that comprised uh, medieval Europe and beyond. Secular. Secular is a term that we will talk about a lot. It basically simply means uh, non-religious. Okay, so uh, think of religious and secular as being opposites of one another, antonyms. Okay, uh, so secular just means of this earth, uh, earthly ideas. Nepotism, favoring people within your family for positions of authority. All right, um, so, you know, for example, a recent example would be like, for example, um, President Trump naming um, like his daughter uh, and her uh, husband and things like that for positions within, um, you know, uh, power in government. All right. That would be an example of nepotism uh, happen happens and, and happened a lot. Um, pestilence is a, like a plague. OK, uh, blight also kind of a plague. Um, Peasants are at the lower end of society. Merchants, sovereign, interregnum. Interregnum means time between reigns. So if we're talking about a period of time where a king dies, and let's say he has a son, but the son is only a child, like five years old, uh, this will be what's called an interregnum period until that child ages to the appropriate age to become king. Um, concubine is like a, a woman that is kept in the position of um, like a like a, uh, what would I say, like a, a the, the reason that word is on there is because priests and popes and other people like that often kept concubines. And what it is, is it's like a, 
It's like a girlfriend, I guess you would say, uh, who you're not supposed to have um, uh, because popes were supposed to be um, uh, celibate. They weren't supposed to engage in, in marital relations or, or uh, physical relations. Uh, regent, a regent is the person who during an interregnum period, the regent would be somebody who is uh, who was um, designated by the previous king who died to watch over the daily affairs until the son became of age. Iniquity, iniquity is like sin um, and um, deviant behavior. And the reason, again, that that word is on there is because there was a lot of iniquity at the upper echelons of society, both by kings and nobles, but also by members within the Roman Catholic Church. Legitimacy. Kings are always trying to um, legitimize their power doing different things. And when we talk about legitimate monarchs, there's any number of different people who are going to try and challenge the king's authority, undermine the king, say that I should actually be the rightful king. This person is not a legitimate ruler. So legitimacy is something that's, that uh, was very important to monarchs of this time because it meant that uh, the more legitimate you were, the more legitimate your claim to the crown was, the less likely it was going to be for somebody to be able to challenge your legitimacy. Uh, dynasties are just, again, families that pass down through the generations. Holy Roman Empire is that collection of various territories within Central Europe. Uh, a vassal, that's another great term to, to learn. When we talk about lords and vassals, really what we're talking about is you could be anywhere on that socio uh, the uh, so, uh, feudalism ch uh, chain of command. Okay, You could be anywhere within that. A lord is going to be referring to somebody who is above you on that chain of command. A vassal is going to be referring to somebody who is below you on that chain of command. So lords above you, vassals below you. Um, corruption, you probably have heard of that term. Uh, and then urban versus rural. When we talk about urban areas, we're talking about cities. When we talk about rural areas, we're talking about the countryside. And the vast majority of people in Europe at this time lived in rural areas. Um, there were actually very few densely populated urban areas in the late Middle Ages. Okay, uh, as you can see, here's kind of a little bit of a medieval social hierarchy for you. Of course, at the very top of both the secular and the religious hierarchies is God. Everybody, essentially everybody in Europe at this time is devoutly, devoutly Christian, okay? And when I say Christian, uh, we need to be clear that I'm referring to Catholic, okay? Now, you might think to yourself that there's a difference between Christian and Catholic. To be honest with you, it's that that's splitting hairs a little bit. The reality of the scenario is this. Christianity, as a, as a religion, has uh, existed for a very long time. Uh, however, for the vast majority of Christianity's existence as religion, uh, the really the only form of Christianity that was practiced was Roman Catholicism, all right? So Catholics, in fact, the word Catholic, if you look it up outside of its religious connotation, simply just means kind of general, okay? So general, Roman Catholic Church, meaning like the general Christian faith, all right? Um, so, uh, so, so why is this important? In modern day times, uh, I think that uh, uh, kids and, and just anyone, become a little bit confused about uh, about how this all works. From essentially uh, about the mid 300s, when Emperor Constant Constantine of the Roman Empire um, designated in the year 360 AD Christianity to be the official faith of the Roman Empire, um, this is when the Roman Catholic Church really came into formation. It wasn't until around the 800s or 900s that there was a split in the church. And the first split in the church happened over something called the liturgy and um, how the liturgy was performed during mass. At that time, there was a split in the church where Eastern nations, and they weren't really nations, Eastern empires would be a more accurate way of saying it. Eastern empires, for example, the Ottoman Empire, uh, as well as the Greeks, the Russians, and so on, uh, split into what became known as Eastern Orthodox Christianity. So, so it's not until after six or seven hundred years that we see a split, the first split in the church. And even then, you only have two kinds of Christian, and the vast majority of, of Christians 
in Europe are going to be Roman Catholic, all right? Uh, it's only that you would go further and further east into Eastern Europe that you would find Eastern Orthodox practitioners. Then again, we see another split in the church in the uh, early 1500s. And this is where we see the development of what is known as Protestantism. So when we talk about Christianity, all of these faiths, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestants, all of them fall under the title of Christian. All of them are Christian. They all have the basic uh, uh, Christian beliefs, okay? The, where things get confusing is when Protestantism develops, which is we're actually our second unit in this class, where Protestant develop, Protestantism develops, we see a number, many, many, many different kinds of, uh, of denominations of Christianity develop from Lutheranism to Calvinism. And uh, Calvinism itself can be split into the Presbyterians and the Huguenots and the Puritans and the Dutch Reformed Church and so on. And then you see other ones too, the Mennonites, down the line, eventually you get things like, uh, in America, the Methodists and the Baptists, and you have uh, Quakers, and you have uh, all the way up until modern day times where you even have just kind of your regular run-of-the-mill non-denominational Christians, okay, who are kind of just a catch-all category of Protestants, all right? So, you know, and e even more, there's tons of them, there is Episcopalians, and, and so it, 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 the list just goes on and on. So Protestantism, and that root word of Protestant is really protest, and, the, and we'll get into why that is, but they were protesting the Roman Catholic Church and broke away from the Roman Catholic Church to establish their own dom, uh, denominations of, of Christianity. All right, anyhow, getting back to this list here, God, kings, dukes, earls, counts, marquises or marquesses, barons, and then you eventually get to knights, which are going to be, when you get down to knights, you're in what's, what's known as the area of gentry. Knights were kind of at the top of the gentry. Gentry are generally, though, lesser nobles, okay? Um, knights, squires are below knights, and then you have even lesser lords of the gentry below them. And so this is like, this is kind of the, the hierarchy of how, of how it all goes. Then you eventually leave the noble classes and you just get into your run-of-the-mill commoners, um, uh, villains, peasants, serfs people like that, and then eventually at the very bottom rungs of society, you had slaves. However, don't be confused. The types of slaves that I'm talking about at this time are really not of the African slave trade. Slaves of that time um, also performed very different tasks. It's kind of comparing apples and oranges a little bit to talk about slaves of Europe in the Middle Ages to the slaves of the Atlantic slave trade a few hundred years later. Scrolling down the basics, religion, we talked about this. Um, it's not possible to understand the importance uh, uh, of, of European history without respecting the profound influence of religion on people at that time. Now, when we talk about religion in this class, I want to be clear that, um, you know, sometimes people get a little bit touchy about uh, talking about religion in public schools. I am not preaching to you. I am not preaching a faith to you. Your religion is your own business. Uh, it's covered under the constitutional rights that everybody has. Okay. Uh, so freedom of worship and all the rest of it, that's on you. But I do need to talk about religion for the purposes of contextualizing just how important religion was for the entire construct of people's understanding of reality at that time. So we will be talking a lot about religion, but I will not be preaching in the class about any particular faith. Okay, here we go. Um, so what is taught about religion uh, is really just factual in this class. All right. Um, Roman Catholic Church has its own hierarchy. So if you were a clergy member, a clergy man in particular, because women were not able to hold ecclesiastical positions within the church, uh, you have God obviously at the top. The Pope was considered God's earthly vessel. And so whatever the Pope said was essentially an expression of God's will. And that, can, that shows you just how important the Pope's position was within the church and within society. Beneath the, the Pope, you have cardinals. Uh, the College of Cardinals is the uh, group of, of, of cardinals that uh, from which the Pope is selected when the Pope dies. Um, and then you have archbishops, bishops, priests, deacons, monks, friars, nuns, and then your everyday worshiper. Kind of an important thing to remember, popes have names just like uh, you and I do, but when they become a member of the church, they take a Christian name. 
um, like a, a papal name rather. Okay, so you have your birth name, you have your papal name. So you could have, for example, uh, Pope Sixtus the fifth or something like that. But that title or that name Sixtus would not have been his birth name. Um, just like today, Pope Francis, his real name uh, is not Francis. His, his real name is something else. But that was his papal name that he took. Okay. Um, the basics, talking about religion, um, all phenomena, all phenomena essentially across the board was explained by the Bible, or really more accurately, somebody explaining the Bible to you. And what I mean by that is keep in mind, most people at this time are illiterate, meaning that they can't read the Bible. Even if they could read, keep in mind that the Bible was written in Latin. So they wouldn't have been able to read it because it's written in a dead language. The Latin language hadn't been used outside of Christianity or in any sort of common dialect with people for nearly a thousand years by the time that we get to the Renaissance. So, so Latin falls out of usage. It's a, it's a dead language of sorts. And, um, and, and so when people would seek counsel on the Bible, what they would do is they would go to their local you know, pastor or priest and um, ask them for guidance, and uh, people were very adamant about confessionals and things of that nature. And um, and so uh, the the it was the it was the role of the Pope to interpret the Bible for you. Now keep in mind, if you're in a particularly remote area, perhaps you're even your priest isn't able to read. Um, he may be trained in giving the liturgy or whatever uh, in in Latin, but would have about as little idea of what the words that he was saying were as you would. And so um, one of the reasons that people begin to criticize the Roman Catholic Church by the time that we get to uh, the late Middle Ages and into the Renaissance and the 14 and 1500s is because um, the, the meaning of the Bible became very, uh, very elastic, okay, very, very stretchy, meaning like people were interpreting the Bible and saying, well, what this means is this, and here's how it applies to your individual circumstance. All right. Um, as you can imagine, this leads to uh, quite a bit of, of openness in the inter interpretation of the stories of the Bible. Um, and, and, and people strayed from the literal uh, words on the page. Uh, one of the, one of the um, goals of the Protestant Reformation when we see people protest the Catholic Church and begin to break away with it, starting with Martin Luther in 1517, is that um, it is that, that that the Bible should be the true word of God. The the Scripture uh, is what matters, not the interpretation of popes, priests, and so on. Um, and so so that is that's very important to to understand. Okay, now to question the Church was expressly prohibited. In fact, quite the opposite uniformity was expected. And this goes back to that idea of individualism doesn't really exist during this time. You are expected to be uniform, to question, to, to, to challenge the authority of the church uh, is, is going to uh, draw, uh, um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Suspicion. It's going to draw suspicion. Okay, people are going to be suspicious of you if you begin to question the church. They're going to um, they're going to think like you are stepping out of your place. In the same way that if you were in the military and you were some low-ranking member in the military, and a captain was to tell you this is what you're going to do, and then you question the captain's orders, that would not go over well. The same idea was very true across all of society at that time. There was no questioning your lord. There was no questioning. The members of the church. They were above you in society. They knew more than you. And the expectation was you listened, you did not question. And even if you felt in your heart of hearts that so-and-so was wrong about something, or you felt something was unfair or unjust or whatever, you ex were expected to keep your mouth closed and go along with the program. Quite a different world than we live in today. Questioning of authority is really baked right into the bread of the American spirit. Uh, people question things these days that they don't even really need to question, and and uh, and that kind of uh, that kind of you know uh, uh, critical uh, spirit is encouraged here, right? Um, not so. 
not so back in the olden days. Uh, to be Christian was not simply a religious choice in those days. It was a dominant framework for everything from morality to society to law and understanding anything that happened in the world. High-ranking ecclesiastical figures were typically also very, very wealthy, very powerful, and also very willing to sin. And so as much as they may have been these esteemed, prestigious figures within the church, uh, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of rule breaking that happened behind closed doors. And of course, the vast majority of worshipers across the country would not have been the wiser to it as they would have never even really known what's, what was happening outside of their small little hamlet or shire that they grew up in. Okay, so some religious terms that you might want to uh, that you might want to know moving on to the the next uh, slide here. Papal or papacy, whenever we say it's not papal, okay, it's papal, that's how you say that word, or papacy. Uh, papacy simply refers to the, the pope, okay, or the position of the pope, papal of or referring to the pope, okay. Simony, we'll talk about simony in a little bit. I'm going to get into that when we start the unit and stuff. Excommunication, pontiff, these are terms that perhaps you've heard before. They may not make a lot of sense to you right now. But when we get into um, talking about the, uh, the Protestant Reformation, I'll be using some of these terms here. Schism simply means a split in the church. Piety. Piety is like your, um, your religious devotion. Somebody who's very pious is very religiously devoted. Celibacy means um, not engaging in physical relations, which was an expectation of all papal figures, and, or excuse me, all uh, ecclesiastical figures at that time. Uh, that word ecclesiastical just means somebody within the church. Uh, at any rank. Uh, a pagan. A pagan was somebody who, um, you, you don't see it as much by the time that we get into the um, into the late Middle Ages, but paganism was essentially the beliefs of the Romans. And, and if you were a pagan, uh, a Roman pagan was somebody who, um, who, who wasn't a Christian that still believed perhaps in the old gods of like the Roman god, like gods like Mars or Apollo or Jupiter or things like that. Okay. Um, uh, idol, idolatry, um, idols were very important within the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and, and so, um, like Catholic churches, uh, as you can see this beautiful cathedral in the background on this, uh, on this PowerPoint slide, uh, it was very, um, common for Catholic churches to collect idols, which were, uh, holy items that perhaps were owned or touched by, um, by saints or other esteemed members of the Roman Catholic faith, and so um, it could be it could be um, somebody's remains could be considered um, holy, or it could be uh, a chalice, or it could be a necklace, or it could be any number of different a vial of blood or something like that. There were all sorts of different things that were considered idols, and um, and back in the olden days in the Roman Catholic faith, it was much more common for people to worship to individuals uh, or to uh, pray to individual saints. Um, so if you think about like praying to God was like a catch all prayer category. If you wanted to pray about something specific, like a harvest or, um, you know, uh, good, good fortune on your travels or, or whatever else, there were individual saints that each had their own speciality of things that you would pray for. Um, iconoclast convent, uh, and, and a papal bull is like an official, uh, document from the Pope. Uh, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to move on to the next one here. All right, this is where we get into some of the tools that you can start to put in your tool belt of how to analyze documents, readings in particular, but other things as well. Um, when we think about history, you have to understand that history is a subject that is very broadly encompassing. When we talk history, we can be looking at issues from any number of different angles. And I've taken the big angles that we would typically look at things through history and reduced them down into a, a, a six-letter phrase called Persia, P-E-R-S-I-A. Persia is a nice tool for you to use to be able to categorize uh, the information that you're looking at. So when we're looking at something in history and we ask ourselves, where does it fall in Persia? What we're really asking ourselves is, is this a political thing that I'm looking at? Is this an economic factor of history that I'm looking at? Is this a religious lens of history that I'm looking through? Is this, is this social? Is it intellectual? 
Is it artistic? All right. These are the major categories of analysis of the various documents, the fact, the primary factors that you're going to use to analyze causes, effects of historical phenomena. And the reason that it's so important is because it helps you to, especially on like a DBQ, it helps you to organize information in a more coherent way. All right. So um, you may not know what all these terms mean, and that's okay because I actually have slides that will tell you what they mean coming up here. We may, you know, as a 10th grader, I don't necessarily suspect that all of you are intimately familiar with politics or economics or even religion or anything like that. All right. So, so when we talk about these things, what is it that I'm referring to? Well, let's move on to the next one. When we were to, if we were to talk about political factors in history, anything dealing with governments, okay, uh, that could be figures within the government, that could be governments interacting with one another, diplomacy and things like that, um, anything to do with alliances, treaties, wars, courts, political parties, anything to do with laws or legislation. L legislation just means lawmaking, okay? If we talk about a legislator, that's a person who makes laws, all right? Anything to do with that sort of stuff. Also, anything judicial, crimes, punishment, OK, those kinds of things are what we would refer to as political aspects of history. And it's good to know this because it helps you when you read a document to say, OK, this is a political document because it's talking about whatever um, the political party in Britain of the, you know, in the 1700s or something like that. OK, and this one here is from the uh, the opposing political party in the 1700s or what have you. The point being this. OK, that it helps you to categorize the information that you're looking at and begin to kind of weave a thread between various sources to say, here's how these ones are connected. These ones are both talking about punishments for whatever crime. OK, these ones over here are both talking about outcomes of treaties. And, and Persia is a way of helping you keep that in, in line. Um, this is not going to go in order, but I'm just going to uh, go to the next one. We'll skip over to S here. Social factors in history. What kinds of things would be social? Anything to do with education, anything to do with healthcare, language, customs, regional customs of a particular type of people, even things like entertainment, okay, that could include feats or festivals, F-E-T-E-S, feats, festivals, okay, um, and then uh, various rights of the people. Uh, also, anything to do with like age gender, uh, ethnicity, sexuality, uh, interactions between groups or classes. Uh, remember that economic classes are also an aspect of this. So we talk about the social hierarchy of things. That would be a social uh, factor as well. Okay. Um, economic factors. Economic factors could include things like the buying and selling goods, anything to do with the economy, really. When we talk about the economy, we're talking about the, you know, the exchange of goods uh, and services on a marketplace. And marketplaces could exist anywhere. They could exist locally. And as time goes on, they grow and they expand to being much more global. Um, land, labor, capital. Capital just means money. Anything to do with the development of money systems, international trade, agriculture, industry. And then also, and this could, it's bordering on the lines of political, but it's also partly economic. And that is the level of state control. How much does, this, does the government interfere in the economy and create laws that regulate or restrict commerce or economic activity? All right, all of these are economic factors. Intellectual factors, writing, literature, philosophy, new developments of understanding, like for example, the scientific revolution brought a, a whole host of new intellectual developments. The enlightenment brought about whole new developments in political philosophy. OK, these would be intellectual changes. Now, education, I mentioned before, but when we talk about education from an intellectual perspective, we're talking about things like literacy rates, the degree to which the number of people around Europe understood certain things. OK, when we're talking about educational systems and who's going to school and what class of people is going to school and stuff, that's more of a social thing. Right. And then things like inventions, new inventions, math, science, anything to do with that would be intellectual developments. All right. Uh, religious factors in history, anything to do with sin or salvation, beliefs or teachings, holy books, 
deities, saints, the clergy, Protestantism versus Catholicism is going to be a recurring theme in this first part of the class. And then finally, um, artistic. And that would be things like paintings, sculptures, music, architecture, the features that comprise the different schools of art. All right. What makes this classical piece different from this, um, you know, whatever piece of realist art from the 1800s or what have you. Okay. Um, uh, and then the various styles and creators of each of these. And we'll, again, we'll be talking a lot about art in this first unit, talking about the Renaissance. Okay. So um, at this time, we are starting to wind down um, on the lecture. It is, let's see here. You, I believe so. I've been going for about, what time is it right now? 8.44. I think I still have about 15 minutes. And what I'm going to do here is just clarify a couple of things. Number one, um, there is a new assignment that is already posted on Canvas for you. I put it up essentially at the same time as the last one. It also uh, is accompanied by the reading from the textbook. Um, if you have not yet submitted your first 20 questions or 21 questions or whatever it is, uh, for uh, for today's assignment, you do still have time to do that before it's considered late. I deliberately put the uh, due date at 11.59, or the uh, due time at 11.59 p.m. for today. So if you have not yet submitted that by today, please make sure that you do so. Um, the next one, the next assignment that will be due, will be due on Monday. So you'll have today, tomorrow, Saturday, Sunday, and much of the day on Monday to submit that one. And hopefully that gives you enough time to do that. Um, there is more than enough work for you to do. So I don't want to pile more work onto you at this time. I, what's most important to me is that you're utilizing your time wisely and that you're doing your own work, not just simply relying on your friend to do the work for you and then robbing their answers from them. It would be very easy for me to click the box that says turn it in on the next assignment to make sure that people are not deliberately copying each other's work. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt on the first two. If I suspect that people are not being honest, then I will start using Turnitin to submit the assignments. Um, so please do your own work and utilize the time that I will be giving you uh, as we conclude class here in the next few minutes. Um, it would also be wise for you to be checking on to uh, on to Schoology or not Schoology. I keep saying that Canvas. It would also be wise for you to continue checking on Canvas as uh, for next class on Monday. I will be adding some um, documents that we are going to begin to analyze using Persia. All right. Um, and give you a bit of practice using that for today. Please feel free to review the beginnings of the AP Euro uh, unit one uh, PowerPoint, which is in PDF format. I have put it on PDF format because, again, as I said, not everybody has um, Microsoft Office on their computers, so you should be able to access it without a uh, problem. And um, so there's going to be a uh, like a late Middle Ages um, PDF on there. It's already on there. And I would suggest that to help contextualize your reading a little bit more that you can begin to look through the notes as well. So um, at this time, uh, I have not taken attendance, so I'm going to do that really quickly. If you are here, which I think that everybody is, to be honest with you, why don't you, um, for attendance today, I'm going to have you guys write, uh, type in your favorite animal. Type your favorite animal into the chat, and I will take attendance based on that. This is good. Huskies, elephant, hippos, penguin, another hippo, fox, wolf, wolf, fox, lion. Nice. Tiger. Good choice. I'll type mine too.
There we go. I actually have um, this little thing on my desk. Ask me about my cats. I have two cats, Mochi and Harrison. They own the keys to my heart. Very good. Well, everybody, if everybody has submitted their uh, favorite animal, then, uh, then that's fantastic. And um, thanks so much for tuning in. The rest of the time is yours to continue doing your work and submit your stuff for today. Please do hand it in by the time the day ends so that you can get full credit on it. I will be adding those to the grade book uh, for your assignment for last class because I have to submit something every day. So, but I have to give you time to do it, of course, as well. So I will be, um, I will be adding those to the grade book later on today. Hopefully you have it in by the time that I do it. And, uh, and so again, thank you so much and we'll see you again on Monday. Take care, everybody.